for years, um, business education has been focused on um, sort of preserving or stewarding scarce resources and putting at risk plentiful resources. And until the last 20 years, those scarce resources were capital and the plentiful resources were people. Just put new people on the machine because we had these piecework production lines. Now what's happened is capital's plentiful, as we can see, and people are scarce, talent's scarce, productivity's flat. And so we need to reverse the model and say our scarce resource is really human capital. Mm -hmm. And we should put at risk financial capital to make human capital better. If you look at the education systems which are underfunded, 85% of the kids in Harlem schools are two grade levels below the reading level. 40% of the kids in the Harlem schools are living in homeless shelters. How are people learning? And what does that mean for us a decade from now? Uh, when we get uh, when these people come into the workforce, you know, I, I want to explain this book. It's a collection of personal stories, and it, it kind of shapes your view on on employees and employee care. Um, and, and coming from Aetna, that makes a lot of sense. But for people who don't know you, they may not realize your own personal experiences mm -hmm. and how that shaped things too. Uh, you had a son who had leukemia at one point. Lymphoma. Uh, lymphoma. You ha also had a, uh, an issue with a spinal cord injury yourself. Right. So you have seen up front and personal um, some of the problems with the health care system. I think last year you described the health care system in America as the worst possible experience of any experience you could have. Mm -hmm. um, has that changed or what needs to happen to make that change? Well, what we really have is a warranty system. When you sign up for your financing of health care, much like when you buy your car, you get a warranty card. And it says, when you break, present yourself to a dealership, and we will fix you. What we don't think about is the human being in totality. And the World Health Organization in 1948 defined health as the social, psychological, spiritual, and physical well-being of the individual, not just the absence of disease. But our system is focused on the absence of disease, like a biogen yesterday. And so this whole idea of changing the system to focus on the holistic view of the human, to keep them away from the institutional system, to make the system more human and in the community and in the home are a lot of things that you see going on with the tech companies today. Mm -hmm. You know, Jeff Bezos last week decide, um, announced HSAs and FSAs online through the Amazon cloud. That's really powerful stuff. If you weren't somebody who had been running a major company, a major healthcare company for a long time, I might think of all that and say, oh, that sounds nice. but. It's not the way to profit. You are somebody who comes at this and always looks at profit first as a way of doing this. And, right. and that's the way that you set up your business. Explain that theory. Every 50 basis points at Aetna, we reduce health care costs, creates another $490 million worth of underwriting margin. So everything we can do for an individual to keep them away from using the institutional system, to arbitrage the lower pricing in the community and in the home, versus what goes on in the larger institutional system. Creates a huge opportunity from a margin standpoint, which impacts costs. And so every year I sat down with our actuaries and said, give me 350 basis points of healthcare cost reductions we should pursue this year. How, that's how we generated high margins and maintained our margins for nine years while I was leading the company. How common do you think that mindset is across healthcare executives in America? Because you're focusing there on margins a lot, I would imagine, focus on top line as well. Well, I think it's an economic, it's an economic flywheel. If I continue to find ways to keep people healthy and keep them away from the system and invest in them in their community and their homes, that's going to generate lower health care costs, which is going to generate more underwriting margin, which is going to allow me to reinvest in the business and manage my prices. Mark, I, I think the difference, though, when some people look at ways of saving margins, they would say, just deny people for all kinds of care. Right. And that's the Crazy. traditional way of, of doing things. Right. How, how do you come at that differently? What are some of the examples of that? We learned that at Medicare Advantage. When the Bush administration pushed Medicare Advantage forward in 2005, they said, how do we get you to take care of sick people? Yeah. And we said, "Give us, pay us for the risk we're taking. And so they did, and we created a risk-adjusted program. And we found that 75-year-olds with three chronic comorbidities, with a nurse attached to them every, almost every day, was five times more profitable, generated five times more margin, than a 24-year-old that never used their health care. Because the rates were at $1,100. So I said, wait, the light went on and said, if we invest in these folks, provide transportation, socialization, help them at home, keep them away from the system, we're going to generate more opportunity. We're going to generate a better individual who's going to have a better life. Is but that you paying for the nurse to come in and see them on a daily yes, basis, too? Yes, of course. But do drug companies, for example, have that same mentality, the same incentive to, to, to drive and think about things as you do? 
No, I don't think they do. I think we're, if you, there was an MIT study done five years ago that showed that capital in the drug industry went to drugs that showed a very short return on investment. That drugs that would take a long time to develop or a long time to result, realize results weren't getting the kind of investment that they needed. Companies like Regeneron are doing that, where you have scientists working on really big issues. But right now the drugs are looking for the magic bullet. And the magic bullet is harder and harder to find. To be and easier. it requires more and more and more work with other things other than drugs themselves. There should be a quantum uh, move in, in terms of what you just said. Yep. I mean, rational because drug of what we know. Yeah, I yeah. mean, we, we, the basic science, would, you know, there, it's building up and that I, I can't imagine there's not a quantum leap. It shouldn't be getting harder and harder for magic bullets. It should be easier and easier given the state of our understanding of the molecular level of everything that, that's happening. But what happened to Biogen yesterday wasn't realistic. I don't think so. Either. I mean, I think it was crazy. Because you, when did you think beta amyloid didn't work? I thought it didn't work two years ago. Two right, years ago. And, and so they're they're doing research. They're doing applied science to try to find a way to commercialization. That's what they should be doing. But yet we're trading on a basis that says, well, does this drug work today? Did this trial pass today? And so the investment model in drug development is all wrong. We're focusing on things that need to show quick profits or quick opportunities and revenue instead of the long-term impacts, which are really the impacts that are crushing the U.S. economy today. Um, I have so many things I still want to ask you about. Very quickly, though, I'll ask you about radical capitalism and how you deal with things like Medicare for All that are being talked about in today's political system. Is it reasonable to think that we can pay for everybody? or? Do you think there's another path? Well, let's talk about Medicare for All. Yeah. So, I, you know, I say Medicare for All, single payer, great populist term to throw out to the public and say we're going to fix it all. What is it? Nobody can tell me. Yeah. They have all the same look. I say, well, tell me what it is. Okay, then tell me a country that has a program like that. And most people say Canada or the UK. Right. That's Those are I'm not thinking. Medicare for All or yeah. single payer systems. Those are socialized systems where the providers and the whole provider network is part of the public program. They're funded by the government, by the provinces in Canada, by, the, by NHS in, 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 in the UK. Wouldn't single payer here mean that it's a, it's a public option and that there aren't any private options anymore? Isn't that what it means? So that's the second question I ask. Who runs all of our public programs today? Not the federal government. The private insurers. The private insurers yeah. run them all. I have the first check cut for Medicare in 1965 on my office wall to Hartford Hospital. The health care insurance companies are the intermediaries for Medicare and Medicaid. We run it for the government. They give us the specs. We build it out. And so when you put those two together, the only place where we have a program that looks like the UK or Canada is the VA. Right. And that's not going so well. No. Right now. And, and we want to build that out bigger. That's not a big selling point for the private sector, what you just said about that you're running Medicare. Thanks. <laughs> the, third, the third and the last. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things in Medicare, a lot yeah. of waste and a lot of fraud. Yeah, there and a is. Lot of things. In Medicare fee-for-service, not a Medicare Advantage, right? which right, is what right. we run more tightly. And the third thing I would say is Vermont got within three months of opening their program up and realized that the tax increase on their citizens was so high to fund it, they couldn't do it. Colorado killed it after they passed it. Um, in, 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 in an election. Didn't we try to drive a stake into Medicare Advantage? Did, did it survived though, right? Didn't it's, it? not, it's too big now to kill. It's over 20 million lives. But th that was part of Obamacare, wasn't it? They didn't like that. No, no, that was Medicaid expansion. Medicaid, me, no, Medicare, Medicare Advantage was on, the, on their... So they, there's we, a target on the back of that too. But. Sure. And back to the ACA, if we allowed Medicaid expansion to happen, and we would have means tested people down to age 50 for Medicare, mm -hmm. particularly Medicare Advantage, um, so 60, 50 to 65, we would have covered more people than the ACA did at far less cost because those programs operate and effectively run.